right. Is this one in your inventory? It's not. Dude, is it is it country, man? And I met you last night, baby. Before you opened up, I can't I can't take it that far. I, is, is this what you wake up to in the mornings? That's actually my alarm clock. Nice, man. I like it. My wife hates it, but it really gets it gets the people going, Trent. Gets the blood flowing. <laughs> Talk about getting <laughs> if you knew about that song, yes, it does get the blood flowing. <laughs> Oh, shoot. Uh, it, speaking of getting the blood flowing, Trent and I, uh, before we hopped on the live here, we were, I mean, dude, we were going through the topics for tonight. <laughs> I don't, I almost wish we would have hit record a little bit sooner because I feel like uh, everything we were talking about was sort of on point with how we felt about some stuff. Chris's and blood was just boiling over. It was getting pretty I, heated. I had to have somebody come in and check the pressure. You know what I mean? Like my, I was red in the face, just... It, there's a lot of things that uh, that I got to get off my chest here during the podcast, and I, I think we got a lot of good topics that are lined up. First and foremost, where I want to start is this is this is like uh, this is big picture stuff, Trent. This is like bigger than football. This is bigger than sports. This is like humanity type stuff, Trent. Do you have any plans for the solar eclipse coming up on Monday, April eighth? You're shaking your head. No, zero interest. No, I mean, I'm going to step outside and look at it, but... Are you I, in the path? Are you in the path where you're at yeah, down there in Ohio? Yeah. Okay. So, around us, hotels are selling out for like $400. Like, why oh, yeah. are you... Why are you... I don't know. I just... I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to look at it, but... Dude, I'm not... I am i don't need to go spend that much money to, to look at this thing for four minutes. Yeah, well... Well, here's the thing. Like, I, I get what you're saying, and I've... We looked at hotels. I mean, I think <clears throat> so. We're we're gonna drive about an hour south, uh, somewhere around the Bowling Green ish area. I think we're gonna try to be to to catch it. But I will say this: back in 2017, uh, my wife was pregnant with our daughter at the time. We took our son with us. We went down. We were living in Chicago at the time. We went down to Southern Illinois, and we were able to take in the uh, the full eclipse. And it was. Uh, <laughs> Dwayne Jones, I gotta get this stuff. Dwayne Jones from the Facebook page says, literally never gave AF about Eclipse. Listen, this, see, this is the problem, Dwayne. You haven't given yourself the right opportunity. And anybody who's like <clears throat> knows anything about space or how all this shit works, there is a massive, massive difference between 99% coverage and like being 100% in the shadow. And when we went to see it in 2017, we drove like I don't know, three hours south to go be in the shadow. And you it drove was, three hours to look at that? We did, yeah. And it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Like, it's just a, it's a, it's a human thing. Like, it, it, I don't know, it connects you to, like, something bigger, I feel like. And it's like, dude, when the sky goes dark and then you look at the tree line all around you and it looks like sunrise everywhere and then you look up and you see stars and you see this dark black disc with these like these beams coming out of it and there was weird shit that was happening around us too so we were staying at a vineyard um we had a tent that was popped there was like a i don't know maybe 30 or 40 other people there but like the the crickets came out and started chirping and there was a pond near us and fish were like jumping in the pond like it was the wildlife was going crazy so like i feel like it's an incredible experience and people i feel like who've experienced totality the the full shadow they they understand that. And the fact that it's not going to happen again for another 20 years, I feel like if you're if you're in a place where you can go and get in there and, and, and be in the shadow, you should go and do it. Because I know for me, I just turned 40 this year. Uh, do some acid, same experience. I mean, I'm not going to deny, Dwayne. That's, that's a good point. Like, you can just sit home. It's probably cheaper and certainly going to save you on gas. But uh, <clears throat> no, I take that back. Dwayne, get out of your house. Get in the shadow if you can. I know that there's going to be some weather, but... I personally encourage anybody who's never seen it, been in the shadow, try to get yourself there because it's just an incredible experience and, and you got to do it at least once in your life. So that's my uh, the more you know moment uh, to, to lead into the show. And then let's just get right into basketball because it's Dusty May. Look, the guy just started job the job practically yesterday. And he's out working his ass off, building his staff. He's he's doing work on the recruiting trail. Trent, he's made a couple of new hires. I know you've put up a couple articles about it on winghelmetmedia.com. Uh, what are your thoughts about the hires that he's made and sort of, 
you know, just, just what things look like with Dusty May running the show here for what, I don't know, about a week or so. Yeah. So, uh, a few days ago, he, he, no, none, none of, none of, none of this is actually official yet, but, uh, he, it sounds like he is going to hire Mike Boynton Jr., which he was the head coach at Oklahoma state for seven years. I believe he was more, he was known as a defensive coach. So I, I feel like he'll probably be the defensive coordinator per se of the basketball program, but he was an elite elite recruiter. He recruited Cade Cunningham there. Who's now with the Pistons. But, uh, so he, he definitely can recruit. And then today I'm going to butcher this dude's name, but, he hired uh <laughs> practice it you practiced it before we went live so there's no excuses Trent so he just today he hired Akeem Miss Kadeen who was a assistant coach at Georgia but he actually coached with Dusty May at Florida Atlantic a few years ago uh, he's been in the SEC for the last three years he spent two years at Georgia and then a year at Florida. And once again, he's been known as a really good recruiter. He's kind of younger. He likes to get his feet wet and feet wet and that stuff. And also, he's the primary recruiter of Kahane Ruth, who was a Michigan commit, decommitted, was considering Georgia. Well, now Miss Kadeen comes over here, and it's it's looking good in that recruitment. Yeah, I mean, I <clears throat> I think there's a lot of excitement, um, you know, about what he's doing early on so far. Michigan got some good news. Will Shatter is back. He's going to return. And then uh, Terrence Williams did announce that he's going to declare for the NBA draft with the option to return. Excuse he also me, entered the portal, too. What's that? He also entered the transfer portal. Terrence Williams did? Yeah. Okay, so so hold on. So So he's in the portal entering the draft and yep. with the option to return. Isn't college yep. athletics great? I mean, you, you can essentially, you can sit back and say, look, I'm going to keep my options open. I could be anywhere this time next year and, you know, more power to him. I mean, I think, you know, Terrence Williams, um, he seemed like he was kind of a polarizing player here. I mean, I'm, I'm sure as a person, a great guy, but in terms of who he was on the floor and what he provided, you know, there were some people that were, you know, that, that liked what he brought to the table and others that thought he came up, uh, pretty short on the court. So we'll, we'll see what ends up happening, but overall with dusty may, I mean, yeah, it seems like he's bringing good guys to the staff. I know he's out on the recruiting trail. He's active. There's some players from FAU that it seems like maybe there's a possibility he can bring some, some legitimate talent to Ann Arbor. So again, it's early. It hasn't been that long. It's been maybe a week or two. We'll see how these things materialize over, over the coming weeks. But just like with Sharon Moore, I mean, I feel like it's okay to be excited. Like they haven't done anything on the court or on the football field yet, but what they've done in the limited time they've had, I think for Michigan fans, it's okay to be excited and, and to be, you know, kind of happy about the direction that things are going, um, you know, with, with both programs, with the basketball program, with the football program. Speaking of the football program, we're going to make that transition now. That's enough basketball talk. We're eight minutes, a little over eight minutes into the show. Hey, we, we spent like 20 some minutes. I was going to say, dude, sometimes we'll go 20, 25 minutes talking about basketball. That's too much. Eight minutes, you know, nine minutes. That's, that's about all we need right now. Speaking of football, uh, I, Trent, I asked you about this before we hopped on the live. We're starting to see the uh, Los Angeles Chargers coaching staff and, and, and members of the staff having their press conferences as camp opens or as practices open. And I caught one today that that really it, it caught my eye for a number of reasons. It was Ben Herbert, former strength and conditioning coach at Michigan, who's obviously now out uh, with Jim Harbaugh in L.A. Uh, ben Herbert went to the podium today and was explaining kind of his uh, – his philosophy in developing guys. And again, for anybody out there who watched it, like you already know what I'm talking about. But for those who didn't, like when Ben Herbert talks, when he speaks, I feel like you kind of, you lean into the screen a little bit and you want to like, there's just such an intensity and an intention with what he says that it's not a surprise to me that he had so much of an impact on the players and the Michigan football program as he did, because you can just, some people have said it before. Some people just have it. And Ben Herbert has it. And on one side, I was like, man, LA got, you know, they have a hell of a strength and conditioning coach. There's absolutely no doubt about it. 
But then there was a part of his press conference where you know, he was talking about, you know, physically what he wants to do with the body to make sure you you become harder to break is what he kept saying. But then he transitioned to the mental part of his approach and, and kind of, you know, how he trains guys to, to think differently. And he was talking about the weights. He was talking about like two and a half pound weights. And he's like, when you put the weights, you know, he's got that that Ben Herbert stare and he's looking at you. When you put the weights back on the rack, there's a there's a little logo right there. And every single weight, the logo is straight on. And, you know, I, I had to like snap myself out of it. And I'm thinking, okay, how is this going to resonate? I, I get how it works at a college program. These are young, impressionable guys. These are guys looking for, you know, leaders and mentors and and and, and trying to develop themselves into pro players. And and I feel like that type of thing works really well in a collegiate weight room. I'm not sure how well that transitions to the pro level, particularly when you've got guys who are, you know, veterans, pro bowlers, making millions of dollars a year, been in the league a long time. Hell, a lot of these guys even have, they pay their own personal trainers to go through their own workout regimen. Trent, you saw the video today. What were your thoughts overall on Ben Herbert in LA? And then did you did you ever get the same sense that I got that like you're you're curious how this is going to translate to the NFL? Well, my first initial thought was how many strength and conditioning coaches actually get up there and talk to the media. Now, I've never ever covered the NFL. I've never covered an NFL team, but usually you're talking about the head coach, the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, and sometimes your position coaches. I, I have never, so, okay, I'm a big Vikings fan. I've never seen the Vikings strength and conditioning coach get up on the podium and speak to the media. Do you even it's know just, what he looks like? Do you know who he you. is? No, I could, could not tell you. It's, it's unbelievable because we, I mean, we've seen this at Michigan for the last several years under Harbaugh, just how much that Harbaugh, how much he, he loves Ben Herbert. It just, yeah. it's, it's unreal. As a strength and conditioning coach, you just you don't you don't hear them speak to the media like Herbert actually does. But yeah, that I mean now transitioning, that was kind of my whole thing with him leaving Michigan. He had Michigan at the palm of his hands. He could basically do whatever he wanted to with the college kids to get them in in shape to go to the to the NFL. Yeah, I don't I don't know how he's how this translates to the NFL. You're talking about $20 million players getting paid. And like we talked up, talked about before, if you're a fan, you're going, you're going to these games to watch Justin Herbert play. You're not going because Ben Herbert's a strength and conditioning coach. So if Justin Herbert doesn't want to do something, he's probably not going to do it. And there's going to be no punishment about it. You're paying this dude. He's your franchise player. You're paying him all this money. So yeah, that's, that, that's been my thing the entire time is, how, how does Ben Herbert translate to the NFL after being a strength and conditioning coach in the college for, for a long time? Yeah. I, and, and look, I, I don't want this to come off the wrong way because I, obviously I value Ben Herbert and what he did here about as much as anybody can value anybody's contribution to the point where like, I want him to come back. I don't want him to fail in the NFL, but I would welcome him back with open arms in a second in Ann Arbor. But yeah, I, I, the intensity that he brings, the you know, the philosophy, the attention to detail, you know, that and you know how it can be in the NFL. I mean, you you know, there's a lot of ego. There's a lot of people that have different moods and different outlooks on life and I just that's going to be something to keep your eye on because you're right, Trent. I haven't seen a lot of strength and conditioning coaches step to the podium and talk about their philosophy and kind of be in the light the way that Ben Herbert is. But I think that speaks to how highly Jim Harbaugh thinks about him. And obviously, I'm going to wish him luck. I hope that I hope the Chargers, I hope the players give him an opportunity. I hope that they buy into what he's selling because I think JJ McCarthy said it earlier today on Twitter. Like he retweeted the video of Ben Herbert and he said, the proof is in the pudding. And so look, I get that these guys have a lot of games and a lot of experience under their belt. They're making a lot of money, but I think Ben Herbert is somebody who brings a ton of value to a locker room, to a culture of a program. And, and I think the, the chargers would be better, better served to, to sort of follow his way and, and let him do his thing. So 
hopefully it works. But yeah, I do. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit skeptical, especially when we got to the weight part and how everything's. I mean, you know, they fucking put the weights back on the rack. I don't give a shit. Like I just put him. I'm, I'm going home to my family. Like I don't care. Like we'll see how that resonates. Um, should we transition from Ben Herbert to just? I saw Matt Kirby bring it up uh, a little bit here, and I know what post he's talking about. Matt Kirby from the Facebook page. He said, "Good news for the winged helmet is that you have a lot of followers from other teams." I don't know. Is that good news? Eh, maybe. I mean, look, action is action, right? We're, as long as we're getting some traction, everything's all good. But Matt Kirby says he made a comment about the beautiful helmets that Michigan has, and every other program made comments. Uh, so, so basically nice to see that you guys have a lot of followers. Look, I know what post he's talking about. I put something out about the Michigan football helmet, essentially being a work of art, how beautiful it is. And to nobody's surprise, almost like, uh, the way syphilis appears every now and then, you know, you, you can't ever fully get rid of it. So I've heard, uh, you know, these Ohio state fans just continue to show up. And, uh, you know, voice their displeasure about everything Michigan related. Trent, we were talking about this before we went live. And this, this really got me heated a little bit because, look, we're now three years into Michigan's dominance over Ohio State. And I'm just, I'm wondering at what point will that fan base take their medicine and be able to sit back and say, Michigan is just a better football program right now. That's not what they're doing. Instead, it's deflect, it's brag about recruiting, it's talk about what's coming, it's accuse Michigan of cheating, accuse Jim Harbaugh of this. But at no point in time over the last three years have I seen anybody within that fan base just sit back and say, look, Michigan's just got a better football program right now. We got to get better. Coaching has to get better. Players have to get better. And I told you, I, this was this was part of what I said to Trent before we went live, is that I remember what those two decades were like, where Michigan was getting its ass kicked nonstop by Ohio State. I singled out the 2016 game where a lot of Michigan fans, they want to point to the spot with JT and, and, and you know how that wasn't. I didn't subscribe to that. To me, the spot was irrelevant. It could have gone either way. It went Ohio State's way. So be it. The spot wasn't the reason that Michigan lost that football game. Wilton Spate had an interception. Michigan had a costly fumble. There were mistakes that Michigan made in that game that ultimately led to them losing it in the end. And when I think about the the two decades of, of misery against Ohio State, I never once blamed anything on Ohio State. And I know for a fact that Urban Meyer and Jim Trestle, they weren't choir boys. I know there was shit going on. I know there was a bag man. I know there were dirty tricks. But they were bringing in top-level talent. They had great coaches. And they were beating the shit out of Michigan year in and year out. And so my criticism was toward the Michigan football program. We need to recruit better players. We need to get better coaches over here. It was never this sort of like, ah, we're the victim over here and life isn't fair and Ohio State's doing this and Ohio State's doing that. At what point in time, Trent, I'll ask you, how many, how many losses in a row do you think it's going to take for Ohio State to take their medicine and just admit that Michigan's on a better playing field right now? It's not going to happen. Michigan could win the next 10 you years. Think, and you don't think a fourth? You don't think dude, a fourth? No. No, it's they, Michigan could win the next ten years, and it's going to be, it's going to be the same thing year after year. Unfortunately, I, I'm, I've lived in Ohio for thirty years now, and I'm God used to it. You, Trent. God bless I, you. How do you, how do you do it, man? I mean, you, you must. Dude, are, you, are you surrounded by Buckeye scum oh, everywhere yeah. you go? Yeah. I don't know how you live that way. Dude, it was terrible those years that Michigan lost like 100 games in a row to Ohio State. It was terrible. Did you just I mean, walk around and call them cheaters and try to deflect <laughs> and deflect? Is that how you got through that time? You have to, yeah. You got to you got to be like an Ohio State fan. But <laughs> no, like I'm telling you, man, it's again, Michigan could win. They could win, continue to win the series and it's going to be, be the same thing. You know, the, just like uh, the whole sanction thing. And there's and everyone's going to know what I'm talking about that that is on Twitter. But there is one account, in particular, on Twitter that keeps just fueling everybody's fire about Michigan, and it's just constantly Kenneth Grant's transferring, Mason Mason Graham's transferring, Colston Loveland Loveland's transferring. They're yeah. getting hit 
hit by the sanctions. Tony offered, we didn't want him. He's terrible. And so on and so forth. And it's, it's going to be something new every single year until Ohio State finally gets a win again. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, I get it. And I've said this before. I know social media isn't real life. I understand that. But there's just such a level of... Um, denial among the Ohio state fan base that I just, I struggle with it because look, the worst possible thing that could have happened to Ohio state was for Michigan to do exactly what it did this year. Right. Because all of the cheating stuff, all of the allegations about Connor state, I mean, shit that that happened week, what seven against Michigan state was a week, seven week, eight. So everybody was looking at sort of like Penn state, that's going to be the reckoning for Michigan. That's when they're going to have to try to come to terms or come face to face with what they really are. Well, it didn't happen in Penn State. Michigan went in and whooped that ass. And yeah, the score didn't look as dominant as you might think. But anybody who watched that game and was there they in controlled person, that game, Michigan dominated that game. There was zero question over who was going to win that game. And then from Penn State, it was like, okay, well, Ohio State. Now the day of reckoning is coming because Ryan Day's had time to prepare. They've got all the, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. And, and all of these players that they've got. Guess what happened in Ann Arbor? Ohio State once again got their ass whooped. And again, score looked close. I can tell you, Trent, I've watched a lot of Michigan-Ohio State games and have found myself nervous often. There was not a single point during that game in 2023 where I felt nerves at all. Michigan was going to win that football game. I had no question about it. So Ohio State can't get it done. So Michigan now goes to the Big Ten championship game. And I don't. we talked about this before. What panel was it where the majority of the panel was picking Iowa? It was game off? day. It was game so day. You had uh, college game day. Yeah, college Kirk Herbstreit, he, he picked Michigan. And he was telling everybody how delusional and, and insane they were for picking Iowa to beat Michigan. Kirk Herbstreit was like. He Corso was, was picking Iowa. Yeah. Uh, Matt, McAfee. Matt McAfee was picking Iowa. Reese Davis maybe was it picking, uh, picking Iowa. And then Michigan goes into Indy like they always do, beat the shit out of Iowa, right? Shut them out. I don't know. There haven't been too many shutouts in the Big Ten championship game. Michigan's got one of them. And then, well, we know Michigan's going to the playoff. This video comes out where the, the, the rankings are being released, and holy shit, Michigan is terrified of Alabama. You could hear the audible gasps in the room. They don't want to play Bama. They don't want any piece of the Crimson Tide. What happened in the Rose Bowl? Michigan once again gets the W. Well, they're going to go to the Natty and they've got to face Michael Penix Jr. in this high, or is it Junior? Michael Penix, or is it just, is there a Junior at the end of it? I don't give a shit. Michael Penix. I think it's Michael Penix. You got to face Michael Penix, the high octane offense. They haven't dealt with anything like that all year long. The Wolverines are in for a long night. Dude, that game was a snoozer. Once again, like it, th there was never a point where it felt like Michigan was going to lose. And by the end of it, the end result is 15 and 0. Big Ten champion, Rose Bowl champion, national champion. And I think if you are an Ohio State fan, if you want to keep talking shit, it's fine. Whatever. Like that, that's that I get that that's part of the rivalry. But somewhere deep down in that blackened soul that you have, you have to understand that Michigan just had a better football program than you did. They were the last better three years. The side of the, the ball. Last three years. They were better on the offensive side of the ball. They had a better coaching staff than you had and they bullied you for three straight years. If you want that to change, if you think your recruiting rankings are going to change it, the guys you have now, what Michigan is going through is going to change it, that's all fine and good. But at some point in time, take your medicine and just admit that Michigan was better. And you know what? They might go into your building in 2024 and do it all again. And I'm telling you what, Trent, we've talked about this. All of the pressure is on Ryan Day. All of the pressure is on Ohio State. And if Michigan goes into the horseshoe again, losing Jim Harbaugh, losing their entire defensive staff, losing 18 guys to the draft, and they beat the Buckeyes in November, holy shit, I cannot wait to see what their reaction is going to be. Uh, I mean, it, it, does Ryan Day survive it? No. no. Does he come back I don't, from I don't care if they go 11-1, and one and that's their only loss to Michigan. I truly, truly believe that if they lose to Michigan, Ryan Day, is, he's done. It's over. It's over. And that's, I, and that's really where so. we're at. That's where we're at. So I, I get it. Asking an Ohio State fan to be reasonable. I mean, it's hard to ask some Michigan fans to be reasonable about things. I every, get it. Every team has delusional fans. Correct. But, and maybe it's because I'm surrounded by them, but I feel like Ohio State fans 
are by far and away the worst. And but the you know worst. they've had so, they've had so much success, not only against Michigan, but going to the national championship and so on and so forth. And I just I don't think they can deal with the losing. The last three years, Michigan has dominated them, crushed them in the trenches, and I just don't think that I don't think they can handle it. They don't know how to handle it. And that's it, where we're at right now. I mean, they have been a successful program for a very long time, and it took precisely three seasons for Michigan to completely break them. Mm-hmm. I just think that that's in some ways it's hilarious and I'm enjoying it. And, and Trent, you know this. I mean, and, and all Michigan fans know this. When you win a national championship, there isn't much that bothers you during the offseason. Like the offseasons can feel very long when you don't win a national championship because now everything is about the next season. Who are you going to get? What's it going to look like? What's the record going to be? But when you experience a national championship, like, dude, I, I'm enjoying the offseason. I'm, I'm fine with it going as slow as it needs to go. I'm just, I'm having fun with it. But man, every post that gets put up, like, half of these Ohio State fans spend the majority of their time talking about Michigan as opposed to talking about their own program. I just think there's some sort of like, I don't know, there's like a clinical, you know, maybe maybe there's a way to diagnose these folks. I'm not sure. It's just weird behavior. And at the end of the day, just, God damn it, just admit that Michigan had a better football program than you have. We don't know what it's going to look like in 2024, and hats off to Ohio State because you did a hell of a job getting guys albeit had to use the bag, but pulling them out of the portal, did a hell of a job on the recruiting trail. Ohio State has a legitimate national championship contending team going into 2024. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But if you think that it's just an automatic win in November when Michigan comes to Columbus, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know why you would think that. Like, I get that Michigan lost so much, but they still have a ton coming back. They shouldn't, but they do which is why it's going to be sweet because listen, you say that there's nothing that can get them to take their medicine, a loss in 2024 in November, you'll have to take your medicine at that Dude, point. Dude, I'm Ryan telling Day, you. You have plenty of time, you. Ryan Day, to change your signs. <laughs> that, that, that's something that bothers me. The whole, in the, you still see these big Buckeye accounts spewing the whole Connor Stallions thing. If it, uh, So after, after that Michigan State week, you're telling me anybody, any of these teams, especially Ohio State, still had their same signs that Connor Stallions was allegedly stealing. They would be it'd be ludicrous. Like why why would you not change everything up? Like this should have been a fresh slate for Ohio State going in, going into Michigan. The bottom line was Michigan was better. For the third straight year, Michigan was better than Ohio State. I mean, watch the film. You know what I mean? Like there were some throws that JJ McCarthy made. Like it didn't, it didn't matter what information you had, what like he's he's buzzing it by the tower, like right by your defensive back's head. Like that's just talent beating other talent. So again, I think we've given these guys enough time. We'll we'll give them a little more time just because I this is part of what I think falls into this conversation. And one of the things that you're hearing from the people in Columbus is that. You know, a, a sign that the hammer is coming, that Michigan's falling off the cliff, is the fact that Michigan just won a national championship. And right now, the 2025 recruiting class ranks 41st nationally. 41st nationally. They've got three commitments right now. And I think we said a walk on just committed. Yeah. Right? Yep. So you got four guys as part of your 2025 class. All of them are three star guys, at least the commitments that committed prior to the walk on. And you're 41st nationally. So, Trent, when you hear that, are you concerned that after a national championship season that Michigan, as of what, we're April 4th now, is 41st in the nation in recruiting rankings for the 2025 class? Yes and no. I mean, no, because it's a brand new staff. These kids want to they want to figure out who who is going to be coaching Michigan, who the position coaches are going to be. They want to get get to know them, see maybe where they translate into the equation. What is concerning, though, is Michigan is coming off of a national championship. You would think kids would be lining up the door at the door wanting to commit to Michigan. They've had now three straight really good seasons. They've been to the playoff, finally got the job done. They've beaten, beaten Ohio State three straight years. I mean, it, that part is a little concerning. I feel like Michigan should be capitalizing off of winning a national title. But again, like you said, it's April 4th. They have a, they do have a brand new coaching staff. So we just got to see what happens. 
<sighs> yeah, I agree with everything you said, but I, maybe I'll take it a step further. A, I don't give a shit about recruiting rankings, especially not in April. None of it matters to me. I mean, when you take into account what NIL has done to recruiting, what the transfer portal has done to recruiting, if you are somebody who's sitting back in April and you are distraught over where you rank in recruitings or you are patting your yourself on the back saying, ah, we're one of the top dogs out there and you're doing that in April, I'm sorry, you're just not very bright because people who commit decommit. They reopen their commitment. They use big time programs to gain some notoriety and then to get some other offers and then they reopen and they end up elsewhere. And then they commit later on and then somebody comes in with a bag and they switch their commitment last minute. So I don't care that Michigan is 41st in the recruiting rankings right now for those reasons. And the other reasons are uh, the reasons that you mentioned, Trent. Michigan just lost its head coach after nine years. It also lost its entire defensive staff and some members of the offensive staff. This program is going through a transition right now. So just because guys haven't committed doesn't mean top-level players aren't interested in Michigan. I think what it means is they want to see what the coaching staff looks like. Then once that staff is in place, let's try to build some relationships with these, these coaches, see if we vibe and see if this is a place where I want to be. So you know, again, if you're if you're somebody in Ohio saying, uh, you know, Michigan being 41st in the recruiting rankings right now is is a telltale sign that that program is about to go through something. Look, you're an idiot. You don't understand reality. The reality is Michigan is bringing in new coaches. The reality is that NIL transfer portal, all of this other shit, it means that recruiting really isn't relevant until you get like, I don't know, in the latter state. I mean, what, February is signing day, right? They have an early signing day now, which is what, early one. December, I believe. December. Okay, so we're talking about December, for which, I mean, December is technically the signing day. There's not really many people that are signing in February that didn't sign in December. But you're talking about something that doesn't occur until December. We're in April right now. Are you telling me whoever you have committed to your program, you feel great about that with the way things work on the recruiting trail these days? I don't know what to tell you, but yeah, Trent, uh, you know, 41st in the recruiting rankings. I'm not worried about that at all. I think that things will certainly pick up. And and I think Sharon Moore and the coaching staff he has in place, these guys are the great dudes, great recruiters. And I think the Michigan football program is a program that a lot of players want to be a part of, but you got to do your due diligence and don't commit just to commit to Michigan, just so that you have that block M and you can sort of flaunt that around. Like I want guys that commit here, they do it because they want to be here and they're doing it for the right reasons. And I think Michigan's okay with that. Not that it overly matters right now, but it is notable that Michigan's starting to make more of the top groups for some of these big time players. Like since Tony Alford's come, Michigan's made two or three top groups of four or five star running backs and that they weren't even really that interested in Michigan until he came here. So for all of those Ohio state fans saying that he can't recruit and they didn't want him anyway, I mean, I think he's done a really good job getting Michigan into the mix for a couple of these really top-rated running backs. You know who Ohio State did want really bad? Tim, Tim Drago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on now. Like, you're going to shit on Tony Alford on his way out, and then you're going to go and hire Tim Drago. No, no, yeah, but he's really good. I mean, no. Like, he's really good. Yeah, but when he was in Ann Arbor, like they were shitting on him all the mm -hmm. time. And now that, you know, so it's again, like you can't take this stuff too seriously. I think it just speaks to the way that fans are going to say whatever they got to say to make themselves feel better and to cope. And the good news is when you've won a national championship, there's not a lot of coping that needs to be done. You're just, you're just enjoying, you're enjoying the experience. And uh, that's kind of the way things work. Um, we're at 34 minutes here. We're going to, there's, there's a list that we want to get to as we get towards the end here. Trent and I, another we another list, huh? another list. <laughs> uh, did I do that right? I'm not religious. I think I got that right. Uh, there's another uh, list that Trent and I put together. We, we were talking about this and we wanted to do a fantasy draft for the spring game. And I thought that that was going to be really interesting. And um, I think it presents some interesting talking points, but before we get to that list, Trent, We've got to address another list. We've got to talk about another list. Um, look, I'm surprised that I didn't have people showing up here with pitchforks and torches ready to drag me out of the house and beat me 
for my top 10 all-time defense, all-time offense list, top five all-time, you know, both sides of the ball. Same with you, Trent. Like, if, if for any of you Dude, guys... we were getting blasted it, online. Blasted. I sent... As, as soon as I put up our list, we were about 10 minutes into it, and I took a screenshot of, the, of like... There were, like, eight comments in a row, and I sent it over to Trent, and it was like, <laughs> this is the worst list ever. Recency bias. How do you not have Patches O'Houlihan on here from the 20s? Like, it was all of this just... Uh, incredible hatred and for those who, who don't remember so trent and i were thinking like we've seen a lot of good football here you know in our lifetime i'm 40 trent how old are you you're still you're 30 in, i'm 30 you're 30 i'm 30 man jesus christ i thought you were a little bit older than that see nah, now i now i really feel old okay trent trent's 30 i'm 40 either way we've seen a lot of good football in our lives and so we thought it would be nice to put together a list of you know who do we think? Like, if we were building a team, top ten all time guys that we would want on our team defensively, top ten ten all time we'd want offensively, top five overall. Who are the guys we'd want to build our team around? And I thought our lists were pretty solid. I mean, you had guys like Aiden Hutchinson and Blake Corum and JJ McCarthy and Quiddy Pay and David Ojabo and Denard Robinson and uh, I mean, I, you know, uh, Braylon Edwards and on and on and on, but. Here's some of the comments right here. Uh, a whole lot of recency bias. Where the hell is Anthony Carter? Nowhere to be found. That's blasphemy. Where is Tom Harmon? Where is Tyrone Wheatley? Where the hell is Ty Law? Like, did we really screw it up? Did we get the list that bad, Trent? Was it, was it that horrible? Well, to be fair, when we started doing this on the podcast, <clears throat> we both talked about how our, our list was about the players that we actually watched. Yes. So I don't think people actually understood that fully. With that being said, like I included a few guys that I did not see play. Like, so to preface, I remember 1999 was the first season I remember watching Michigan football. So yeah, like I've got Charles, you got to have Charles Woodson in there. I, I, I didn't see him play at Michigan, but like, obviously it's Charles Woodson. Yeah. And I, I included Jared Irons on the defense. I included, of course, Desmond Howard. <clears throat> offensively but yeah i mean i don't remember tom Harmon. i uh, you know i don't i he played for my vikings but i don't he remember for your vikings god damn it and you didn't have him <laughs> on the list he played for your beloved vikings dude like i wasn't alive in 1960 1970 what to watch some of these guys so my all-time list was the guys that i have seen play football at michigan yeah, I mean, and, and here's the thing: like, you can you can make an argument about some of these guys, but nobody's going to argue. Like, both of us had Charles Woodson at the top of our list, regardless, right? But yep. Aiden Hutchinson was also near the top of my dude. I got pushback on having Blake Corum in my all time top five. Like, how does that happen? Like, I forget exactly how it was said, but it's like you know, Blake Corum was really good, no doubt about it. But he's not a top ten player. Well, they, like, people were saying that he had, he had two good. People were saying he had too good of an offensive line, but what I mean, he was still good, <laughs> right? So that so that works against him. And then when it comes to Anthony Carter, like yeah, I, I'm sure I know Anthony Carter was great. I'd take Braylon Edwards over Anthony Carter. We can have a debate about that. We can argue about that. But like, we were talking about our lists, and like, I don't know, 98 percent of these guys went in the first round of the draft and were like very effective in the NFL and still effective in the NFL. So I just thought it was interesting for those of you who didn't see the list. Maybe go back to the Facebook page, take a look, but like read, read through the comments because we got Jumbo Elliot. See, God damn it, Matt Kirby here. Like, how are you going to put Jumbo Elliot on the list? <laughs> like, you know, like we, we were talking about uh, Tom Harmon is a perfect example. Like, I'm sure he was good, but do I think Tom Harmon would dominate in today's era of college football? No, I don't think he would. So I think that's where maybe there's there's some of the confusion. Like when you sit back and you just put together an all-time greats list, sure, you're going to include Tom Harmon and Anthony Carter and all those guys. But when we're talking about top 10 all-time guys that that we value, guys that we would want to build a team around, I'm not trying to pluck guys from the 20s and the 30s thinking that they can compete in today's college football. So I I think that's where I did have Bianca Batuga on my list, by the way, John. Uh, I had Jim Harbaugh on my list, for God's sakes. Um, but, you know, you got to understand that 
yeah, maybe we are spring chickens. You know, we're, there is going to be some recency bias. Don't tell me Mike Sainer still isn't an all-time Michigan great. Is he not? J.J. McCarthy, an all-time Michigan great. Blake Corum, an all-time Michigan great. Denard Robinson gets a ton of hate for whatever reason. He's an all-time Michigan great. I mean, dude, he's an all-time college football great. I don't remember exactly what the comment was, but there was some guy that commented towards you saying that your defense was like trash or something like that. I mean, I, I, here's okay. Yes. Uh, Jabril Peppers, Eric May. Absolutely. Uh, Jabril Peppers was in my top five all time. And the reason I put him in there is because Jabril Peppers could do anything. This was a guy who could play defense. He could play offense, running back. I mean, dude, he could throw the ball. He could punt the ball, kick return, punt return. Whatever you needed Jabril Peppers to do, he could do it. And he was in New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony. So, yeah, give me if, if I got to pick five guys from the entire history of Michigan football to build a team around, Jabril Peppers is on that list. I also got a lot of shit for putting Rashawn Gary on the list. But I don't think Rashawn Gary was used very well during his time at Michigan. That dude was an athletic freak and could have done whatever he wanted if he was used the right way. Not really going to get into that conversation. But yeah, was there some recency bias on there? Absolutely. But we've also seen some of the greatest players to ever put on the winged helmet recently. And so I think those guys deserve, deserve their flowers too. Like I'm not going to take somebody off who just won a national championship and broke a ton of records at Michigan to put some dude on from the 30s because he was good way back when. Like, I respect it, everything they did for Michigan, but, yeah, you're going to get some recency bias, especially when your program's been successful recently. And especially when when our list, we wanted to include guys that we we saw. Like, we don't want to watch highlights from the 1920s. Oh, yeah, man, that dude, he could run the ball. Like, you know, like we we wanted to put together a list of guys that in our lifetimes that we've seen that we were like, yeah, that dude is an all-time Michigan football player. Yeah. And and to Matt Kirby's point, yes, with Tom Harmon, like Silver Star, Purple Heart, the guy survived like two separate plane crashes uh, when he was serving his country. I think he had to like crawl through the jungle or some shit. Like he was lost in the jungle for like, if you, here's the thing. If you don't know about Tom Harmon's complete story, just outside of what he did at Michigan, I would encourage you tonight, go read about Tom Harmon. That guy was about as close to being Superman as a human being as you can possibly get. And I have nothing but respect for Tom Harmon. But at the end of the day, is Tom Harmon going to play in today's league and end up in New York at the end of the season? No, it's just, it, it's not going to happen. Today's athletes are built differently. And so, yeah, there's going to be some recency bias, but if I was going to line up my pick versus your pick from the forties, I'll put my money on Rashawn Gary versus whoever the hell you got from, you know, the, the fifties era or whatever the hell you're pulling from. Yeah, I, I fully agree. It's see Trent, it, the, you know, the thing with Michigan though, matters. as long as you agree with me, Trent, that's all that matters. That it's it's you're right. But the thing with Michigan is there's so many good players that yeah. it's, it's it's hard not to have a little bit of recency bias. Like we're talking about three years, Michigan. It took forever for them to beat Ohio State. They they beat Ohio State three years in a row. They make it to the College Football Playoff. Then they go and win the whole dang thing. Like it's it's hard not to have some of those guys included like Blake Corum. How do you not put Blake Corum in there? JJ yeah. McCarthy. How don't you include JJ McCarthy in, in at least the top 10? It's tough, man. But, but you know, that's the thing. I, and I think that's a good point you make is that it's one of the things about Michigan's tradition and Michigan's history is that there are so many great players throughout the years that like you have people who lived through different eras that are going to vouch for those guys. Like, dude, I'll vouch for Denard Robinson till the day I die. Like I, <laughs> It wasn't that long ago that I actually wrote an article making the case that Denard Robinson was the goat of Michigan football, not Charles Woodson. I mean, you talk about getting a lot of pushback on that. I was uh, raked over the coals for that one. But, you know, the numbers are what the numbers are. And if you take Denard Robinson and his talent and you put him, I don't know, on any of the teams from 2021, 2022, 2023, I think that team's got a good shot at winning a natty and you've got a guy who's breaking NCAA records left and right. So not going to go into that conversation, but yeah, overall the point is they Michigan has an incredible history of so many good players. And, and that was what I hoped would happen when we put out that list, Trent, is that I hope people would talk, talk to you a little bit about before we did it, we were going to get a lot of pushback. We did, but we got some engagement. It generated some good conversation and shit. 
it, it took about uh, 15 minutes into our podcast uh, that, that we were able to talk about it. So, I mean, it, it worked in our favor. I would say it was an overwhelming success. All right, now comes the next list. Uh, as I said, Trent and I, we thought about this. We put a lot of time into this and uh, we wanted to do, and, and admittedly, I am not a fantasy draft guy. I have never done a fantasy draft. So I had to defer to Trent for, you know, what are the rules? How does all of this work? What does all of this mean? The and, dude didn't even know what a snake, dra snake draft was. So I don't like, know what, what the hell a snake on, draft man. is. What the hell does that even mean? See, like I, I'm not part of that world. So Trent had to educate me on a lot. We ended up doing our spring draft. I'm going to pull it up. Let's see here. Pull it up. Let's see. How the hell did I get it back up there? Oh, wait. Hold on a second. Here we go. So uh, one of the issues, and, and if, if you can, if you're watching on a laptop or maybe you're watching on your TV, you know, expand the screen because the, the, the names are a little bit... Uh, they're going to appear a little bit small, but, but Trent, I mean, why don't you take people through what the parameters are here and why we did this the way we did it? So we, so originally when I, when I brought this up, I was kind of thinking of just creating the best spring team that you could think of, including like offensive linemen. Chris wanted to actually score this. So we took offensive linemen out. So for this, we, our rosters include two quarterbacks two running backs and then four pass catchers. So it could be three receivers and a tight end or two receivers and two tight ends. And then we have four defensive linemen, three linebackers, and then six players in the secondary. Now the whole point of this is not since we're scoring it, the whole point isn't necessarily to have the best team, but who do we think is going to play the most during the spring game and accumulate the most yardage touchdowns points. Yeah, so you might see a couple of names not picked, but it's not because we would don't want them on our team. It's just because we don't think they're going to play or might not see much action. That's key, Trent. That's key to this because we're, we're trying to garner points from how we think these guys are going to perform and produce in the spring game. So it wouldn't make sense to go with who we know are going to be some of the bona fide starters, superstars on this team, because if you know anything about the spring games, even if those guys are dressed, they're not playing often. And a lot of times they're in street clothes. And so you, you kind of had to sort of make some predictions on who you thought were going to be the guys to step up to perform big in the spring game. And so without further ado, Trent, we're just going to get into it. Uh, I won the coin toss. So I was able to go first. Can any, can everybody out there, can you see the list over to the side? It's, it's not just me, right? You, you guys can see the list out there or at least the little box next to Trent and I, I just want to make sure before I get into this, that the, the box is visible. Matt yes. Kirby says, yes, that's all I need. Matt Kirby, uh, I trust Matt Kirby. All right, let's go. So first pick, first overall pick in the spring draft is in. I had to, I had to add it in. First pick, overall pick, my team, Chris's you'll team. Get, you'll get there. Jaden Denigal at number one. And this was, uh, I don't know. This was one where, look, I don't think I've made any secret about it. I'm an Alex Orgy guy. I believe Alex Orgy is going to be uh, QB one this fall. I like a lot of what he brings to the table, but in terms of what I think is going to happen in the spring game, I think Jane Denigal is going to sling him around a little bit more. I think he's going to put up more yards. I think he might get the ball in the end zone a little more. So I had to go Jane Denigal right out of the gate. And then Trent quickly answered back uh, with his, uh, his first round pick. Shouldn't come as any surprise. Chad Henney. Oh, uh, <laughs> Alex Orgy. Uh, Tom yeah. Harvey. <laughs> yeah so i mean i feel like alex orgy i mean he's going to he's going to try to throw the ball he's going to show people what he can, what he can do and i was kind of shocked that chris didn't go with orgy as much as he's been talking about him all all off season so i went ahead and took my qb1 alex orgy it hurt it you know but I, i'm trying to play the i'm trying to play the game here right because i want to win i, I want to I, you know i want to get the points and i just feel like in the spring game, I'm going to get more from Jaden Denigal than you're going to get out of Alex Orgy. No offense to Alex Orgy. Like I said, I feel like he's going to win uh, the starting job this fall. But let's go into round two, see who your boy picked. Very, very confident about this pick. I've got Benjamin Hall for my second pick overall. Look, 
We know who the two top guys are. I was at the press conference today. Khalil Mullings was at the podium, talked about thunder and lightning a little bit, you know, him and him and uh, Donovan Edwards. And we know that that's going to be the combo this year, but it's really about who's behind those guys. And this is a really deep position group. You've got, uh, you got Cole Cabana back there. You got Benjamin Hall. You got freshman Jordan Marshall. You got Tavi Dunlap. You got a lot of options that can really come in and, and try to make a name for themselves this spring. I've paid close attention to Benjamin Hall this offseason. He's been putting in the work. He looks like a unit. I think he's going to make some noise in the spring game. Let's go and see who Trent made his second overall pick. So I took the Maryland transfer, Jay Sean Barham. I feel like Ernest Ernest Hausman's probably, I don't think he's going to play a ton, but with Barham coming in from Maryland, I think that Michigan will try to get him on the field in a game setting. And I just feel like, I don't know, I just feel like he's going to to, to wreak, wreak some havoc on the on the football field for Michigan. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think we're already all kind of penciling in him in as one of the starters opposite of Hausman. So, you know, he's a transfer. He's coming in. I think he's going to get some reps in the spring. So interested to see what that looks like. Let's go to my third overall pick here for Team Chris. Frederick Moore, really excited about this guy. I have heard a lot about him from spring media availability. Uh, Frederick Moore is one of those guys that I feel like can supplement the loss of a guy like Cornelius Johnson. Uh, we know who Tyler Morris is. We know what Samaj Morgan is all about. Those guys, to me, are are um, a lock for being part of the starting rotation. But it sounds like Frederick Moore is really you know, stepping in. He's going to make that big year one to year two leap, and I think he's going to make some noise in the spring game, no doubt about it. Trent's third overall pick, Team Trent. Who do we got? Who do we got? Oh. Uh, yeah, this, I mean, this could definitely, uh, this could you definitely fell, uh, you fell into a trap here. You fell into a trap. You did. Dude, like, I, like I told you during the draft, I feel like, I feel like almost every player is going to play at, at least at some point. All I need him to do is give me a touchdown. Well, if for I those get, listen, for those who aren't watching or, or maybe you're listening on the podcast, Trent went with Donovan Edwards for his third overall yes. pick. Who we've established now the parameters. This is the spring game, and so we we're we're looking for guys that are going to produce on April twentieth, not necessarily in the fall. Donovan I, Edwards is going to spread out the tunnel. He's going to get starting <laughs> reps. He's going to lead the field, the team down the field, and get a touchdown. Wrap. Well, you know what? That, 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 that will certainly work in your favor. I would love to see it happen, but you know, Bobby, I, I would Bobby on this one. Uh, Trent didn't <laughs> understand this. I think he just got a little bit excited. He saw Donovan Edwards there on the list. And look, if you see Donovan Edwards available, how do you not take him? Right? Like we we've had a, you'll see later in the list. We've got a couple of guys like that. So let's go back to team Chris for my fourth overall pick. Who is it? Zeke Barry. Defensive back, man, I'm excited about this, dude. Do you realize he was the number five overall safety in his class? Former four star, yeah. one of the top players coming out of California. He's now going into his junior year. I've heard his name mentioned a number of times throughout the spring as one of the guys in the secondary that's really stepping up. Is you know, is it more of a corner position? Is it more of a nickel position? Like, is he the answer to you know to replacing Mike Sainer still? Maybe. I remember Zeke Berry had a pretty solid spring game last year from what I can remember. And I think Zeke Berry is going to be one of those guys who's going to get a lot of reps on April 20th because there are guys in that secondary that are trying to position themselves to, to have a starting role. And, and there's plenty of opportunity in the secondary. So give me Zeke Berry at number four. I agree, Bobby. Who do we <laughs> got for, for Trent number four? Let me guess. Will Johnson? Who is it at number four? Yeah, for he, Trent? he might be coming up, though. Who knows, man? He might be there. Hey, this is a very <laughs> solid pick. Very solid. Round four, I, I went with Marlon Klein at tight end. Hey, we all know what Michigan has in Colston Loveland. He could definitely be one of those players that doesn't see much playing time at all on April 20th and Klein has been talked about a ton by the, by his teammates and coaches and he's he's battling for that tight end number two spot so I think that he'll he'll get a lot of play time on, on yeah I mean I, shit Colson Loveland said he's bigger faster and stronger than I am so I mean that's that's a pretty good endorsement of Marlon Klein and then of course you got Hogan Hansen who sounds like he's having a pretty good spring as well so it's going to be really interesting let's round out the top five here we'll go back to team Chris the pick is in who gets that fifth spot on Team Chris? It's Cam Brandt. This is a guy that his name is starting to pop up a little bit. Um, 
who was it? Uh, who the hell was it? it was Derek Moore spoke about him a little bit today as one of the guys to keep an eye on. He's going to be in that rotation. You know, he's going to play in the defensive line. He's going to be at the edge position. Not really sure exactly where he's going to be, but I believe this is a guy that's going to get a ton of reps in the spring game. I think he's going to make some noise. And overall, I think he's going to get me some points to help me win this game. So I went with Cam Brand at number five. Trent, your pick is in. Team Trent. Ooh, Ooh. Like defensive back Brandon Hillman. I, hey, we know Michigan has Macari Page and probably Quentin Johnson starting at safety, but they're going to need that number three guy to to sub in and out. And I feel like Hillman Hillman might be on top of that list. So go get me a, a top safety right off the board. I like it. Brandon Hillman, he's got that dog in him. Like I, I remember being down on the field. I think it was against UNLV. He like he just gets in the face of people. He's, you know, he likes to rattle the cage a little bit. That that guy, I think he's gonna make some noise this fall as well. I think that that's a great pick at number five. So so there you have it. I mean, Trent and I, we both have our first five picks in. I'll ask the fans, you know, what what team are you liking? Who's getting it right here for the spring game? through five picks. Go ahead and throw it in the comments just so we know where we're at. We're going to do this person by person, guy by guy for the next five selections. And then we're going to do the rest in bulk. So we'll hey, go back to my, look at Matt Kirby's got, he's on team. Chris, look, hey, I, CJ, I'm <laughs> def defensive players. We're going one point per tackle, two points per sack, and then four points for an interception. So there you have it. Yeah. And, and I mean, we can, we can elaborate on that as, as uh, spring gets a little bit closer. Maybe I'll put that out on the social media page as well, just so people know how we're going to score this thing. Uh, but let's get into pick number six here as we round out the top 10 back to team, Chris, Micah Pollard at the linebacker position. This is a guy that I feel like is really coming into his own. You know, you, you've got Ernest Hausman and you've got Jay, Sh Jay Sean Barnum at the, you know, who we think are going to be the stars, but who are going to be the guys that back them up? I think Micah Pollard is going to be one of those guys that's certainly going to be a factor. And again, I think in the spring game, he's going to get a lot of reps. So that felt like the smart play for me. Let's go over to team Trent for pick number six. Oh. Big six foot five, two ninety five edge defender Eno Etta. Man, he's talk about a player that's getting a lot of hype this off season. And, six five, two ninety five at oh, the yeah. end. Yeah, he's so athletic, and I feel like he's going to have a big role this season for Michigan. I feel like this was your best pick uh, early in the draft, and and you didn't I think my third pick was. Was the best? No, nah, I thought that was a waste of a pick at number three. But, <laughs> but, but Etta is a guy, and I, I've said this uh, a number of times, Etta is a guy that I, I think every single coach and every single player that has stepped to the podium this spring has singled him out as a guy to keep your eye on. And dude, at 6'5", 295 at the edge, like, yeah, it's, it sounds like a guy you should probably have to keep your eye on. So You can do so much with him, too. You can put him at the edge. You can put him inside with his size. Yeah, I mean, there, You can do so much. Very versatile. Very versatile. Let's go to pick number seven back on team. Chris, this is where I think I start to pull away from you a little bit, Trent. I got DJ Waller Jr., the sophomore stud. Again, another guy who likes to get physical. He's scrappy. Tyler Morris recently said that, you know, he was asked, who's it difficult to line up against in spring ball so far? He said DJ Waller is a pretty tough guy to, you know, to have to get out of his coverage. And so, again, he's a sophomore guy. He's going to be looking to establish himself, work his way into the starting rotation. And I think because of that, he's going to get a lot of reps in the spring game. So I'm excited about DJ Waller this spring. I'm excited about him in the fall. But a hell of a pick by me. I'm gonna I'm gonna pat myself on yeah, the back. Pat your stuff on the back, man. Good job. <laughs> Let's go to Trent. <laughs> Team Trent at number seven. Here we go again. Hey, you, not, you Samaj Morgan, dude. How do you how do you? He's on the he's on the board on round seven. How do you not pull the trigger? Yeah. Hey, the Michigan receiver room is very thin. It's not like we had a ton of players to choose from. To be honest with you. I mean, there's only like six receivers on the roster right now. So I I mean I feel like he's gonna play. Maybe he won't play a ton, but once again, if he can just give me some yards and maybe a score, hey, that's a good pick. Yeah, I mean, that's it. I think that's that's your hope with a guy like Samaj Morgan because he is a known commodity. He's a guy who's going to be a major factor this fall, and it's really a matter of how many reps is he going to get in the spring to do some damage. So, yeah, I mean, he, he is one of those guys where all he's got to do is touch the ball once or twice, and it could be points all day for you. So, solid, you know, risky pick, high risk. High reward, I would say, with Samaj Morgan for the spring game. Let's go back to Team Chris. Uh, Jair Hill, 
I love it. I've got two sophomore defensive backs back to back, DJ Waller and Jire Hill. These are the two guys that we hear along with Eno Etta, Jire Hill, and oh, I'm so, oh, fuck. I already went to, no, wait, hold on. Oh, I didn't press what pause. Are you doing? Damn it. Hold on. No, let's go back. Uh, wait, you didn't see any of this. Nobody saw any of this. Go back, go back, go back. Jire, oh, oh I'm going to go back one more. <laughs> hey, that's a good pick. Uh, damn it. I got so excited with the soundboard that I forgot to hit the pause button. I, I Okay, so pause button, Jire Hill. Uh, he's another guy that's going to be vying for a starting role this uh, this fall. And I think, again, he's a sophomore. DJ Waller is a sophomore. They're apparently making big plays in spring ball, and I think Jire Hill is going to see the field a lot on April 20th. So give me Jire Hill. Let's go back to Team Trent. What do I mystery, pick here? Big mystery. <laughs> Trent's got it number eight. <laughs> hey, so... We have two QBs. They both rack up points. I might as well go get my number two. I'm taking freshman Jaden Davis. I think, I mean, I definitely think Michigan will play him a ton on, on April 20th and just to see what he can do in a game setting at, at the college level. So yeah, give me Jaden Davis. Yeah, solid pick. I mean, I, I agree with everything you said. I mean, he's a true freshman. The likelihood of him getting the QB one job this fall seems Minimal at best hasn't happened since 2004 when Chad Henney did it. And I think Michigan has some veteran options that they're probably going to roll with. And, and you want, you know, you want Jaden Davis to be able to, to get some experience in the program before you throw him out there. And, and so, yeah, I think he's going to get a lot of run in the spring game. Solid pick Trent. I'll give you credit for that one. Let's move back to team Chris for the ninth overall pick. Who do we got? Hopefully people have short memories because your boy can't remember to hit the pause button. Jeremiah Beasley, the freshman linebacker uh, out of Belleville, Michigan, local kid. I like this kid a lot. He's got the size. He's got the physicality. I think he's somebody who can find himself, you know, getting some legitimate reps, some serious reps this fall, but certainly during the, the spring game, I think he's going to get a lot of run. I think a lot of people are excited about him as well. So give me Jeremiah Beasley at number nine. Let's go back to Team Trent for the ninth overall pick. Did this I get might be this might be the pick of the year right here. Ooh. 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 At round nine, I got Peyton O'Leary. I mean, dude, he was the spring game MVP last year. Yeah, and I mean, you know, he's going to play a ton this year too. So I feel like that's an absolute steal at, in round nine. I feel like that's an incredible pick for round nine. Yes, he he has a knack for making big plays in the spring game, and I think he's going to do it again this season. Uh, and I I hope to I hope that he's a guy that works himself into the rotation this fall because it seems like he's got the talent, he's got the skill set. Michigan obviously has you know they don't have a ton of depth at the wide receiver position. He's a veteran guy now, smart. Seems like he could. He can make some noise in the fall, but Trent, you're right. To get him ninth overall for a spring game draft, that might be the best pick you have on the board so far. Let's round out the top 10. Go back to Team Chris. Might help if I hit the button. Who is it, damn it? Cole Cabana at number 10. Look, I think he was injured last year during the spring game. Didn't get a lot of run, but you know, We've heard a lot of good things about Cole Cabana, the speed, the athleticism. I'm excited. Again, it, the running back room is deep. It's a loaded group. But I think if he can get on the field, I'm not sure in what – is it special teams? Does he get some run at the running back position? I don't know what it looks like. But I think on April 20th, we're going to get a better sense of what he's capable of. I, I love Cole Cabana at pick number 10. Trent, let's round out your number 10. Go back to team Trent here. Who did you pick at number 10? Jaden Hood. So Ooh. I went ahead and got my linebacker number two, which is Jaden Hood. Yeah, I mean he he was talked up a lot last off season, and he really didn't he really didn't make his way into the rotation. But it feels like it's new year; they're going to need to find that number three linebacker. And heck, man, he's it could it it could very easily be him. He was a top he was a four star recruit coming to Michigan, and he's here for a reason. And the coaches seem to really like him. Yeah, I love these guys that stick around the program, especially in this era. They pay their dues. They kind of work their way up. And, you know, and now you have an opportunity to do something special. So I like that pick at number 10. Here's what we're going to do now. We're already at an hour and four. I figured this would be the case. So now we're just going to show you. I'm going to go back to my list. I'm going to show you the rest of my picks, go through them really quickly, show you the rest of Trent's, and then we'll get the hell out of here. And so back to Team Chris. Let's just go through all of them. Let's just do the damn thing. Woo! 
Ooh, at number 11, I went with Kendrick Bell at wide receiver. Uh, this is this is an unknown commodity for me, but he's got the length a little bit. You know, he's he's Ronnie Bell's younger brother. I feel like this guy, if he can put on some weight, put on a little bit of muscle, he could be a factor in the fall, but I certainly think he'll have an opportunity uh, in the spring game. And then, you know, I kind of fell into the trap that Trent fell into for his third round pick. I picked Colston Loveland at number 12 overall. I get it. He's probably not going to play much if he's suited up at all. But like Trent has made the point before, I only need one or two big plays out of him before he goes and, and takes a seat on the sideline and coaches for the rest of the afternoon. So I got Loveland at 12. Zach Marshall, on the other hand, is a tight end that I do think is going to get a lot of playing time during the spring game. So I thought that was a solid pick. I got Cole Sullivan, the true freshman at linebacker. Cole Sullivan is somebody that Wink Martindale singled out during his first press conference with the Michigan media said, I like the way that this guy's built. I think he has the opportunity to do something special. I think Cole Sullivan's going to get a lot of run uh, on April 20th. So I think that that's another smart pick by yours. Truly miles Pollard, a veteran in the, uh, in the secondary. I think he's going to get some run there. And then again, I had to go Mason Graham. I mean, we're 16 rounds into this thing. I could not, not pick Mason Graham at that point. Just need a couple big plays out of him. But Trey Pierce on the defensive line as well. I've heard some good things about him. There's some excitement there, so we'll see what he does. But another guy that I think will do a lot in the spring game. Tyler McLaurin at the edge position. Adam Samaha at the kick end. That dude might make me all the points that I need to win this whole thing. I think Adam Samaha is going to be the guy that Michigan leans on heavily in the fall. And then I've got veterans to round it out. Quentin Johnson at defensive back, Makari Page at defensive back, and Davis Warren, who, quite honestly, he could do some damage through the air in the spring game as well. Hey, he was so, good last year. He was really good last year. That's my list, my 22 guys that I'm rolling with for the spring game. Let's see what Trent did over on Team Trent to round it out. All right, so at uh, round 11, I took Brady Prescorn. He's an intriguing Intriguing tight end prospect. Once again, Michigan's they're going to be needing some tight ends to step up, and I feel like he could be could be in that in that mix early on. At uh, number twelve, I took edge rusher TJ Guy to pair him up with Eno Etta. I feel like that's a great one two punch for the spring game. They're and and to give you credit, Trent TJ Guy is another person that we're we're starting to hear often um, from from spring ball as a guy who's emerging and stepping up. I mean, he's a veteran now. He's a senior. He paid his dues, dude. His first season was twenty twenty one. He played behind guys like Aiden Hutchinson and yeah. David Ojabo and Mike Morris and Jalen Harrell, Braden McGregor, like. His time is now, and and it feels like he's going to be pretty productive this fall. That's a really good get at number twelve. And we've been we've been hearing his name for the last two three years about a guy yeah. that seems like he's been up and coming. Uh, but anyway, uh, round thirteen and fourteen, I, I took a couple young guys. I took Jaden McBurrows and Jacob Odin. Uh, McBurrows, he's he's in line for a starting job, so you know that he's going to play. Uh, Jacob Odin, he's a he's a true freshman. You know he'll be on the field getting some snaps as well. And then uh, 15, I took Jimmy Rolder, a guy who played a ton as a freshman, had some injury issues last year, didn't play a whole lot. He's going to, of course, try to get back into the rotation like he did two years ago. And then round 16, hey, Chris took Mason Graham. I got to take Kenneth Grant. Say, look, spring game fantasy draft is the only <laughs> world where Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant both go 16. So uh, 17, another, another younger guy. I took Cody Jones. He's been on the team for... Uh, two years, I think, and he's trying to get himself in the rotation. I've got Brooks Barr at defensive line. He came to Michigan last year, and once again, I mean, Michigan, they rotate so many guys on the on the defensive line. See what, see what he can do during the spring game. Yeah. Um, 19, 19 and 20, a couple more defensive backs. I got Keyshawn Harris, who is a graduate player by now and then also hey name brand will johnson i had to take him on my team can't leave him off the list can't you can't leave him off the list and then uh 21 i got my kicker hudson hollenbeck and at number in the last one i took running back tavier dunlap who that's has been sneaky. around for a little bit and yeah, and that's a sneaky pick at number two i think that that guy can also put up a lot of numbers during the spring game so so there you have it there's our spring game fantasy draft i'll put this out on the facebook page just so you guys can compare contrast tell us who knows ball who doesn't know ball and then we'll score it after the spring game we'll see uh no cj frazier you're not missing tyler morris tyler morris did not make the list and, and again because it's the spring game we had to think like 
I to me, Tyler Morris is is wide receiver number one on this roster. I've listened to him talk now. I think he's got the maturity. I think he's got the talent level. He's become a leader. I just don't think he's going to get much play in the spring game. So I'm I'm going for points here. I'm trying to capitalize. Hey, I took Samaj Morgan. I couldn't take Tyler Morris as well. Like, there's no you way. Did, yeah, you did. Uh, you, you know, and, and Samaj is a little bit younger, so he might get a little more run. But I could easily see Tyler Morris uh, in street clothes, you know, just kind of helping coaching the young guys. So we'll see what it looks like. Maybe I got it wrong. Maybe Tyler Morris has the, the game of his life on April 20th, and I'm kicking myself uh, in the head for not picking him. But we'll we'll put this list out there. You guys let us know what you think. And then I'm excited, man. This, this gives us a reason to pay even more uh, attention to what's going on with the spring game because this is my first fantasy football draft, and i got to be honest, I, I want to win it, Trent. I want to win it. There is a large sum of money uh, that's at play here at stake, and I need to win this one. For the hey, when you, put it, when you put it on Facebook, you better let them know exactly what uh, what the drafting parameters were, <laughs> that we're not trying to put the best team together. We're trying to put <laughs> together... Listen, they're going to rip us apart no matter how. <laughs> like, how do you not have Donovan Edwards, number one? How do you not have? Yeah, it's How does be- Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant go around 16? Do you it's guys don't know football. anything about Michigan? I'll tell you what. It, this list might end us. It might just end the wing helmet as we know it. Uh, we'll, but we'll see. We'll, we'll put it out there. Trent, anything else you want to add to the show? I thought it was pretty solid. An hour yeah. and 11 minutes into it. Yeah, it's kind of fun doing these these list type things. So maybe it's something we can do a little bit more of. I think so too. I think it was a solid show. And look, the name of the game is we want to be consistent. Yes, the eclipse on Monday. Go check it out. Trent and I, as always, we will be back next work next Wednesday. <laughs> Can't even get that right. Next Thursday, damn it. Either at six, six thirty or seven. But you'll see us on Thursday. We'll be back. And as always, we appreciate you guys for tuning in and playing along. See ya. <laughs>